everyone for joining us this evening. We're just going to start with a little a bit about For Our Kids, for those of you that are new here. For Our Kids is a national organization, and we're a network of parents and grandparents in Canada working for a better world for our kids and grandkids. We're run almost entirely by volunteers, and each local chapter is self-organized, doing what that particular chapter feels is most helpful in their region. And since November, our North Shore chapter has been doing this Meet the Experts series to allow people to learn about environmental topics while also getting to know us a bit better. So at the end, we'll tell you a little bit more about how you can become involved, or if you can't stay to the end, just send us an email or go to our website and send us a message there. And I think we can put the contact information in the chat. So there'll be two parts to this meeting. First, we're going to introduce our team briefly and our guest speaker. And we'll also be keeping our eye on the chat for questions. So if you have questions, you can put that them there and our speaker will address them when he feels he can do that. So because we have a large group, we do ask that you try to reserve the chat for questions and not have too much other commentary in there for tonight. And then after our presentation and questions, we'll just have a quick uh, wrap up with some information about our current work and campaigns in case you want to get involved in those. So just a little bit about our team. Uh, on the North Shore, we currently have a team of six of us and you can see you scroll through the participants here. We have Marion, Josh, Lorna, Celine, Jill and myself, Julia, and we have been meeting weekly to share our learning about climate change and related issues and share resources and plan activities such as this one. And we've also supported each other with taking action on issues. For example, many of us have met with our local MLAs to share our concerns about old growth forest protection in BC. And hopefully we can share more about these experiences later in tonight's session. So tonight's topic is one that our family of tree lovers and tree huggers, literally, my children have spent time running around hugging trees. And we particularly value this topic. And I just want to share about the experience, or one of the experiences that led me to joining For Our Kids actually happened six years ago on Earth Day 2015, when our family witnessed a mature hemlock in our neighborhood being cut down. The same week, we'd also witnessed a beautiful mature cedar being cut down, both for new house builds. And my children, who were then five and eight years old, were devastated and indignant. Uh, as was I, but it was their reaction that compelled me to want to take action, something I really hadn't done before. So our family's been communicating with the city of North Vancouver for the last six years, advocating for a tree protection bylaw. And although we haven't been successful yet, we have discovered in the last week that our family's not alone in our love of trees in this community. So as many of you already know, the North Van community has come together to try to save a 200 plus year old cedar tree from being cut down as part of a new development. And with 18,000 plus signatures gathered on a petition to save the tree, the construction company has indicated that it's considering options. And beyond this tree, council has also heard the community's voices for the need for tree protection policy in the city of North Van and is uh, indicated that it is also considering options. So I see this urban tree and the community action to save it as symbolic of the old growth forest in our province, which also need protection. So on to introducing our expert tonight on the topic of old growth forest protect protection. We're very grateful to have Torrance Cost join us this evening as our expert on old growth forest protection in BC. Torrance is the National Campaign Director for the Wilderness Committee and leads the Protecting Old Growth Campaign. Torrance grew up working on a Harbury farm and was constantly encouraged to be outside to learn to be comfortable in nature and in the woods. So Torrance's love for nature is not surprising. And I understand he does a lot of hiking and camping and even got engaged on the West Coast Trail. And of course, he spent most of his career working to protect these natural areas that we all treasure and depend on for their ecosystem services that sustain us all. So I'll let Torrance take it from here and share any more about himself that he wants to and fill us in on the status of old growth forests in BC and what we can all do to help protect them. Thank you, Torrance. 
Thanks so much. Thanks, uh, thanks so much for, for having me. Um, yeah, while you're uh, getting my slides up there, well, that was, that was quick. Um, it made my notes go away. There we go. Um, my name is Torrance, and I'm calling uh, in tonight from my home on the unceded territories of the Cowichan and Malahat uh, peoples. And um, I think that whenever we're uh, gathering to talk about issues of, of climate change, climate justice, or uh, forests, or resources, or land use, we, we need to center in our minds and our hearts that uh, while we connect with these issues, uh, while, while non-Indigenous folks like myself connect with these issues, um, the, the connection to this to these lands and waters uh, by indigenous peoples is, is is something different altogether and all the solutions that we're advocating for need to uh, center justice for those nations and for those indigenous peoples um, I also want to thank you for the work that that you do um, I, I scrolled through the participants just uh, during the intro and there's a couple familiar names and faces um, it's great to see and uh, I, I just think for our kids is a really neat initiative where we tend to insist that both voices on climate change uh, be experts or, or um, you know, be renowned authorities. But fundamentally, this is an issue about the future. And there are no greater experts on that than the parents or grandparents of, of young children who are going to have to live in that future. So when I first heard about For Our Kids a few years ago, I, I thought it sounded like a great initiative. Um, and I could understand the motivation of those of you involved in it theoretically. Uh, and then at the end of May last year, that understanding got a lot more practical. Um, next slide. This is, uh, this is Nina. She's uh, just over 10 months old. And I mean, the, the picture speaks for itself, those bright little eyes. And, and you know, I, I, I felt a strong motivation and a strong call to, to do the work I do before her. And, and, and since it's just, you know, I, I, don't, have to, I don't have to explain too much. Uh, she's just, she's everything. Um, so in addition to, 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 to Nina and my family, I love, I love forests and I love, uh, you know, the, the, the things they represent and the, and the values that they give. And I'm passionate about all the reasons to keep them standing. Uh, and there are a lot, if, if we were to get into all of them, you know, we'd need 10 of these sessions probably. But I think that in this moment, the two most important reasons to protect old growth are, uh, are their importance to decolonization efforts and, and reconciliation in this part of the world and in the fight against climate change. And it's that second one that I'm going to talk about too tonight. So it's generally understood that plants are important in terms of climate change because they consume CO2 and uh, convert it into oxygen, which they release, and carbon, which they store. Um, and while coastal temperate rainforests, the kind of forests that exist here uh, in, in this part of North America, they're smaller in size compared to the boreal forests, say, or the Amazon. Um, these forests are significant in the climate conversation because they have the highest carbon density of, of almost any forest type, of, pardon me, of almost any ecosystem type in the world. So the most biodiverse forests in the world, the forests with the most plants and animals, uh, per area. Those occur in the tropics, in the Amazon, the Congo, uh, the Indonesian subcontinent, but the forest with the most biodensity, a, a little bit different term, uh, they occur right here. So we have an outsized responsibility here, especially in southwestern BC, to keep these rainforests standing. Next slide. Um, oh, one back. Yeah, this is a, a map from the renowned tree huggers at, at NASA, and uh, and it shows uh, global global tree uh, forest mapped out by global tree height. So the darker the green, uh, the taller the trees. So you can see uh, right along the, the west coast of North America, that's the darkest green pretty much on this whole map. Um, some of the tallest trees in, in, in the world grow here and, and that represents that carbon density um, as does the, the next slide. 
Um, so this again shows that that incredible richness. So you can see the, the bigger forests, right? That big yellow band across the top of this map, that's the boreal forest. Um, and, and the swath of orange are kind of on the southern central part of the map. There's the Amazon, then the Congo, then the tropical rainforests of, of Indonesia. But that dark red, that's, that's through uh, the Northwest United States and, and the Pacific Northwest uh, here. And that has, the, again, this incredible richness and this ability to store carbon uh, more than more than just about anywhere else in the world. Um, next slide. So we all learn early on that, that trees grow back, forests grow back. So what's the big deal, right? Um, government and industry have done an incredible job vaguely alluding to forests in their role in fighting climate change. You know, we, we're going to replant trees and, and they do this without mentioning that this must include protecting them. Um, from corporate, you know, we plant two trees for every one we cut down pledges to Justin Trudeau's two billion tree promise. Um, the powerful who are driving the climate crisis love this fun, feel good messaging and, and so does everyone else. Planting trees is, is great. Um, but let's look at the facts about old growth. Uh, next slide. Old growth, old growth store old growth forests store more carbon because there's more living matter by weight. Um, I used to use like a sea otter and a blue whale analogy, but I showed a picture of, of Nina a few minutes ago and, uh, and, and, you know, she's 10 months old. So she's still mainly uh, on nursing. Um, she's eating a little bit of solids, but, but judging by the amount that she spits up sometimes, we know that she's, she drinks quite a lot of milk, right? She can probably sit in a sitting and, and drink a cup or two of, of milk. And, that's a huge percentage of her body volume, right? Because she's so small. Whereas I could fill up a, a big glass with water and, and probably drink two cups of water way faster, but it's a smaller uh, percentage of my of my of my mass because I'm because I'm bigger. So the rate in younger forests, this is uh, the, the argument that younger forests uh, absorb carbon faster. They absorb it at a faster rate. But because they're so much smaller, the total is, is, is less. So these bigger trees that are, again, you know, absorbed, they're not growing quite as quickly, but because they're so massive in the first place, uh, this is, this is uh, where the storage capability of old forest comes from. I hope that analogy, kind of the baby versus the adult, is, is helpful. Um, so a common industry line also is that wood products store carbon. So it's actually good for the climate. You know, we log these trees and we get them into wood products that store the carbon um, and then plant new trees to then grow and absorb more. In reality, no more than 15 to 25% in the car in, of the carbon in a stand of forests is retained when it's logged. So 80 to 85% of the carbon in a forest is, is gone uh, before, it, before it becomes a product. Um, and finally, old growth forests in, in any, native, any native ecosystem, in fact, not just forests in the part of the world where it's grasslands or, or, or marshes, uh, those are the native ecosystems that are going to be better at buffering the impacts of climate change that we're already locked into. So if we don't emit another ounce of carbon into the atmosphere, we're still going to see uh, more extreme precipitation events and storms, droughts and fires. And the places that are going to fare the best in a change in climate are the places with the most intact native ecosystems. Um, so I'm going to look at each of these in, uh, in turn now. Uh, next slide. Um, on the question of carbon sequestration, this is just a sampling of, of how the science has really shifted uh, on, on this in the last decade. Um, and now the, it's basically the consensus that old growth forests are more effective at storing carbon. And most recommendations are that climate plans focus on conserving existing forests uh, in addition to or instead of planting new ones. Uh, this isn't being echoed yet uh, by government and industry because it's harder to do, right? It's easy to promise promise to plant 2 billion trees, it's harder to protect 2 billion of them when the logging industry uh, wants them so much. Um, I'll get to uh, that question about tr uh, trees dying and releasing their carbon. Uh, it's a good one. I'll get to it in a few minutes, um, a couple slides down. Um, next slide. 
So I'm only going to show, I think I showed two graphs uh, in this, in this presentation. Um, but this is, this is probably the most important slide I'll show all night. Um, it's from a US study uh, from a few years back. And it shows that as soon as a tree or a stand of trees is logged, uh, almost half the carbon in that, in that forest or in that tree uh, is released either right then or, or shortly thereafter. Um, so this, this takes into account the logging process itself, uh, the machines, the chainsaws uh, that emit uh, when they run. Um, it takes into account the, uh, the dead uh, organic matter, the branches, the sawdust, uh, the bark, the broken uh, logs that they don't haul out, uh, and those eventually start to rot uh, and decompose. Um, the rate of, of natural decomposition, it's, it's much more slow. Um, when a, a tree falls in the forest, uh, the, the, the carbon, uh, there is some decomposition and some emissions, uh, but it can be stored there for a really, really long time. And the key, the operative word in the rainforest in this part of the world isn't rainforest, it's the first word, it's temperate. Uh, so as opposed to tropical rainforest, uh, this temperate climate decomposition is much more slow. There's less direct sunlight and there's lower temperatures. And the decomposition uh, can happen so slowly that a lot of the carbon is returned to the soil uh, as, as, as a much more stable form. So uh, carbon can exist you know, in, the, in, the, in the geosphere, in the geology, in the soil, in the rocks obviously deep underground as fossil fuels. It can observe, it can exist in the biosphere, so in living plants in our bodies, uh, or it can be in the atmosphere. And it's only in that third place that it's, that it's dangerous and causes problems. Um, so half the carbon's lost at logging. Uh, of the half that remains, about a third is lost again at the mill. So of the logs that make it to mill, uh, between the, the parts of the logs they cut off, the sawdust, the mulch, uh, the, about a third of the carbon that was in that wood is, is lost there. Uh, and then of that remaining two thirds, half of that is offset by transportation. So the trucks that hauled those logs from the forest to the mill, um, ships, if there were ships involved, which there often are, uh, and then the trucks that again brought those from the mill to the market, sometimes ships again are involved. Um, so again, another half. And that's where you get that final column on the far right. Um, again, 15 or 20% of the, of the carbon that was in uh, that, that live tree, and again, the scales to the forest level uh, is stored. And then, you know, uh, the, 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 the line is often, you know, final or, or this is the final storage. And I'm looking around uh, my living room and my kitchen and there's, you know, some wood furniture. The house itself is made of wood. Um, and some of these things, you know, some of the bigger kind of hardier pieces of furniture we might have forever. The house, you know, might outlive me maybe. Um, but is the, with the trees that they were made out of, would they have continued to grow and live? Probably, right? Most of the of the species uh, that grow on this coast are extremely long lived. So, um, the the carbon storage argument uh, is fairly moot because of how long the carbon would would have been stored in the trees in the first place. Um, next slide. Um, this slide is to highlight a little bit of of what the fifty percent loss looks like. So the, the clear cut on the left, uh, now empty of trees, um, contains a lot of organic matter, which is dead, the branches, the stumps. Um, and because it's not alive, it's, it's decomposing and it's emitting carbon and other greenhouse gases like methane. Uh, the photo on the right is a slash pile. So this is the most widespread uh, method of dealing with waste left over after logging in BC. Um, every fall, tens of thousands of these piles are, are lit on fire across BC. And collectively, this, this practice accounts for, in some years, up to a tenth of all carbon emissions in British Columbia. So, so one in 10 uh, tons of carbon that we emit comes from this practice. And despite this, these emissions are not counted in our provincial total, neither, nor is the carbon tax, the provincial carbon tax meant to discourage emissions uh, applied to them. So this is a huge loophole uh, and a huge, uh, a huge um, kind of error in, in, our, in our carbon accounting in BC. Um, next slide. 
So this graph is out of date. Uh, it only goes up to 2012, but the, the, the numbers stay relatively uh, similar. Uh, they just haven't been graphed. Uh, it gives you a sense. Basically, the green is carbon that's been absorbed. So if you, if you uh, compare a forest to us, the, the green is the inhale. Um, the carbon coming out of the atmosphere and everything above the zero line, the blue, the red, uh, and the yellow is, is emissions. Um, and you can see it right around the turn of the century, uh, the, the, the black uh, line in the middle is the average and, and the total emissions started to surpass, uh, started to surpass the, um, uh, the, the amount that it, um, the forests absor absorb, partly because there was less forests uh, and, and, and more fires. Um, there was a question in the chat, why, why are these fires lit? Um, and they're lit because it's currently the most uh, efficient way to, it's the most cost effective way to, uh, to deal with the waste. What's really frustrating is that all that uh, waste, all those branches, those broken logs could be gathered up and taken to pulp mills uh, and to a few other sources where they could actually be used, but it's not profitable for the companies and so they don't do it. And so it's much, much cheaper just to pile them up into piles and then and then light them on fire to, to re-clear them. Um, in the interior, this, this has to be done. You can't leave that much it's called slash the logging waste. You can't leave it on the block because the fire risk is too extreme. Um, it's not as much of a problem on the coast, but it's just, it's too hard for planters to get back in if there's all the branches and logs on the blocks like that. Um, so the, the, the red is the wildfires. And of course, because this graph's missing 2017 and 2018, the, those red bars for those years, those are the two record fire years, they would be off the charts, like completely, um, you wouldn't even be able to see see them in terms of their emissions, um, but those yellow those yellow bars are the slash uh, is that slash burning um, that that we were just discussing, uh, and then the the blue is is the logging itself. Um, again, you know the the the, the carb the emissions that are lost the carbon pardon me that's lost. Uh, not including that 25 or that 20% uh, carbon storage. I think this graph, yeah, it actually uh, gives higher than 20%, which is higher than average. It's a generous uh, accounting. So this kind of shows, uh, it shows, um, you know, a little bit what this looks like. And, and you know, the, the around the turn of the century, the provincial government stopped talking about forests and climate change because their staff were telling them, no, like our forests are actually, they're a net emitter. They're no longer a net uh, source, a net, pardon me, a net sink of carbon, um, which is astounding in a province covered in forests like BC. So, I've spoken about how old growth forests help us keep carbon in the biosphere, one of the places where it's safe uh, and out of the atmosphere where it's not. But I wanna shift now and talk a little bit about how they help protect us from, from, from existing climate change, from the carbon that's already in the atmosphere, basically. Next slide. I showed some of the science around uh, how old growth absorbs and stores more carbon than younger forests, and there's similar consensus around the superior ability of old growth or any intact ecosystem to better buffer the impacts of the climate change that we're already locked into. Um, next slide. There are a couple of, uh, of recent BC reports uh, specific to, to this province. Um, one was uh, done by a colleague, Dr. Peter Wood, just a month ago. Um, I'm gonna drop the link to it in the chat right there. Um, and it, it kind of breaks down, uh, you know, how risks uh, that we're going to see in a change in climate uh, can be reduced through protecting forests by having more intact old growth forests uh, and less and less clear cuts. Um, the other study uh, is just a great, um, whoops, I opened the same link twice. Uh, it's just a great myth, myth buster. Um, one of the, the preeminent uh, forest ecologists in this province, Jim Pojar, just breaks down, uh, you know, what, what the numbers really are and what the science really is on, on this forest and climate question and kind of puts to rest uh, the, the myth that logging old growth and replanting second growth is a, is a good option in terms of fighting climate change. Um, so not only, I guess the analogy that I'm, that I'm trying to, that I'm trying to prepare is, um, 
is not only our forests are our sharpest sword in the fight against climate change by their ability to, to pull carbon and store it, uh, keep it out of the atmosphere, but they're also our strongest shield uh, in that we know some climate change is coming and, and we, need, we need some buffers against that and, and that's old growth too. So to lay them both down, it just, it doesn't make any sense. Um, because because of their ability to to help us in in this greatest challenge we've ever we've ever seen. So uh, next slide. I'm talking about the potential of forests, and and of course you know it's it's yet to be seen whether we're going to utilize this this powerful tool, this powerful ally that we have, um, the ability to store carbon and to protect uh, watersheds from climate change. It's held by old growth forests, but the problem, of course, is that we've cut too many, and we still cut too many of them. Um, next slide. This is probably the hardest to look at slide that I'll show. Uh, it's a it's a map from a great organization out of Prince George called Conservation North, and it basically is is based on provincial government data, and it shows disturbed forests in in red versus undisturbed forest in green, uh, and then uh, and then the mountainy areas uh, in white, uh, and and some of the areas where we don't have the data. Um, this isn't a new problem. It's something that people have been fighting for decades. The Wilderness Committee was founded on this issue in, in 1980. Um, so where are things now? Uh, next slide. So in 2019, uh, the provincial government commissioned uh, an independent uh, review of its old growth policy. And uh, the last April, uh, the review panel, the two person panel handed uh, this government its report. And here's the thing, the report is really good. Um, I'm putting it in the chat right there. Um, I can send these, uh, all these links around too, so don't worry about, about copy pasting all of them. Um, the report is good. It calls the status quo unsustainable, and it calls for a paradigm shift, uh, and it calls for the immediate protection of the most at-risk forest in BC. So the problem isn't the report, uh, the problem is the government's response to it, uh, or lack of response to it. There are very specific timelines uh, in the report and the government's not meeting them. Um, next, uh, next slide. So any of you with, with school age kids, uh, you'll know that, uh, that report cards don't really look like this anymore. They're much nicer. Um, but we, we, we put it this way to get the point across. The grades are not uh, good. I'll link into our, uh, our press release um, there uh, that has more information on this. But essentially we partnered with two other organizations, Sierra Club BC and Ancient Forest Alliance. And uh, we graded uh, how government is doing. And as you can see, they're not doing well. Um, essentially, this government's position is that big. Th this is a big, complex process. It takes time. Uh, the premiers called it a multi-generational process, uh, but that we can't stop or slow status quo logging in the meantime. Um, this is extremely frustrating. You know, a, a fire department doesn't make a update its plan to fight fires while a building is on fire. They go and put the fire out, then they work on their plan. Um, the the uh, company Boeing, they had those planes that kept uh, crashing and I think they just got them back approved for flight, um, the, some, the MAX 8 jets. But in the two years they were trying to fix them, they weren't flying them. But in, in BC, we're flying the jets and it's, and it's really frustrating. Um, and in a way it's worse than doing nothing because they've signaled to the logging companies that a paradigm shift you know, might be coming, you know, the status quo is unsustainable, we wanna protect more old growth, but they haven't done anything to change what the companies can do on the ground. And so the companies are, are really going for it. Um, the problem of course, for the government is, is that the public isn't buying this. Um, the public has access to, to information, like some of the stuff I've shared tonight, they have information to photos and videos, and, and a lot of people can get out on the back roads and, and, and see that things aren't all fine. Um, so next slide. So uh, this is the Ferry Creek uh, blockade and, and essentially uh, it's, it's the public doing the government's job for it. So on the left there, that's Pachidat Elder Bill Jones. And essentially uh, in, in, in early August uh, of last year, a group of citizens just got in the way of, of logging trucks and, uh, and turned logging crews around and protected uh, what is the last intact uh, watershed on Southern Vancouver Island. 
and uh, the the logging company tried to wait them out over the winter. Uh, you know, it gets the the rainforest uh, moniker really applies in November, December, January. Um, but the folks waited them out, and uh, and Teal Jones is actually in court this week. They had their first day of hearing today, and their second one is tomorrow, and they're attempting to obtain a, a blockade. Uh, or pardon me, uh, injunction against the blockade uh, to remove the uh, to remove the um, uh, protesters and and do their logging. Um, so you know photos of of the folks involved, of the equipment being blocked, of the thousand year old trees that are in Fairy Creek and and surrounding old growth forests. Photos of the clear cuts. Um, these are all powerful, but to me, it's just a simple Google Earth uh, satellite screenshot that that really tells the story. Um, that's my next, that's my next slide. So that's, uh, that's Fairy Creek that I've circled there. You can see the Cavachan Valley, Nanaimo, uh, Port Renfrew. Um, if the, if the um, shot went up just a little bit at the top um, above Nanaimo there, you'd be able to see Vancouver and the North Shore in the background. But it shows that, you know, most of Southern Vancouver Island is second growth forest or recently logged forest, the, the brown and the lighter green that you see. Uh, and Fairy Creek just jumps off the picture as this dark green leaf, um, the last of its kind. It's, 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 it's truly a last stand. Um, and, and, you know, when, when we're in this conversation, it's, oh, you know, you know, we have to protect some old growth, but there has to be some balance, you know, logging's important too. And, and I just, you know, when, when we're, when we're told about the need for balance, like you look at, a, at an image like this and we're, we're so far past that. Um, we've gone so far past the point of balance, um, that, that protecting these forests is, is the only shot to get back there one day. So this isn't a nice picture. What's the, what's the solution to it? Next slide. Early, early in my talk, I mentioned what I feel are the two strongest reasons to protect okay. the forest. Um, their, their importance in terms of, of repairing the injustice against Indigenous peoples uh, on, on, on this, in this part of the world and, and their ability to fight climate change. Um, so the solutions stem from that. Uh, there is only one group of people that have lived sustainably in this part of the world, and, and that's Indigenous people. Um, solutions for forests must be based on returning uh, a control of forest and returning land, returning the forest to them, themselves to Indigenous nations. Um, the photo on the bottom uh, right there is, uh, is some stream rehabilitation work, and, and I think this, you know, speaks to speaks to the opportunity that we have, and and to kind of end on a try and end on a more hopeful note. Um, if, if we shifted from forests being these sources of resources, sources of wood and sources of uh, pulp and fiber and things that we use to allies in the fight against climate change, and we started to harvest where it makes sense, you know, meet our needs uh, in terms of timber and in terms of fiber, and then look to restore forests back into optimal cl climate change fighting, ecosystems, you know, uh, by thinning them and allowing the trees to grow bigger, by restoring streams, by restoring their natural function. Um, that's all extremely labor intensive work. It would take a lot of people. Uh, it would create a lot of jobs and it would give us a better shot of, of being okay uh, moving forward in the climate crisis. Um, so that's kind of, you know, those two pieces are, are what I see as, as a vision that we should be moving towards. Um, but we have to stop the problem first, and there are a lot of ways to do that. Uh, the Fairy Creek blockades, uh, I mean, just Google them right now, they're, they're in the news. Um, you know, I can send around some info about how to get in touch, uh, Rainforest Flying Squad on Facebook or Fairy Creek blockade on Facebook is a great uh, spot to start. Um, and, uh, and we also need people to be getting this to the attention of their MLAs. So um, some of the four kids reps have already uh, started uh, this to meet with their MLAs and, and talk to them about uh, this, this critical issue. And, and we essentially need every MLA in government to be getting multiple requests from people in their riding saying, hey, you have to do something about this. That's the only thing they care about is votes and, and we need to be getting that across to them. Um, we've got some ways to, to make that easier. Uh, so next slide. Um, so this is the action page on our website. Um, I'll throw the uh, 
the, um, the link to that in uh, the chat as well. Um, you can see the petition there, but it's actually the tab uh, furthest to the right, uh, the tab that says meet. That's, a, that's an uh, instant way that we have set up for people to meet with their uh, MLAs or to request a meeting with their MLAs. Um, and then it can be intimidating. So both the request itself uh, to information and documents, uh, if you do get a meeting, um, that's all stuff that we can help with and, uh, and that I'm really keen uh, to help with. Um, grow the petition is another big one too. So, so emailing it out to your friends and contacts. Um, obviously there's thousands of people involved, but we need to keep growing uh, and deepening. So more people involved and then taking more levels of action. Um, you know, we can get a bit more into things people can do in the discussion. And, uh, and I think I'd like to leave it there and jump right to that. So my last slide is just some of my contact info, um, ways to get in touch with me. Um, yeah, my email's there. I, I love hearing from folks. I love hearing feedback about how, um, how you know this talk went, what, what I could have done better. Uh, I'm trying to keep my voice down a little bit because Nina's asleep in the other room. Um, this photo's me doing field work a couple years ago, uh, checking out some logging on the North Island. And uh, yeah, I hope, um, I hope this was helpful. I hope it was interesting. And I'd love to hear some of your uh, questions and, uh, and comments now. Thank you so much, uh, Torrance. This was extremely insightful. Um, there hasn't been too many questions because uh, first you have answered them throughout the presentation. And um, I think people were just uh, listening very intensively at uh, what you were sharing. So thank you again. Uh, one question popped up here from Marianne and uh, uh, please uh, in the audience, feel free to add your questions there or unmute, unmute yourself if you'd like to uh, ask your questions. Um, so the first question from Marianne is, how do we get the logging industry on board with understanding that we need sustainable forest management? Um, <laughs> I mean, I wish I had a, a better answer for that. Um, it's kind of a it's kind of a fundamental problem with our with our economic system. Um, the same the same that we see with with fossil fuels, with oil and gas and coal. Um, you know, those business models are, are, are based on doing the very thing that we can't keep doing. Um, and with logging, you know, these old growth forests, the reason why they're so scarce, uh, especially low elevation old growth where the biggest trees grow, uh, is because they're so valuable. Um, right, the, the, the trees uh, that grow here are some of the best in the world. There's, uh, there's pictures in the BC archives of, of wooden sailing ships. Uh, that are flattened out so that entire Douglas fir logs and cedar logs could be placed on them and that wood could be uh, shipped around the world uh, before before steam engines. So sailing ships that were big enough to carry logs because there was uh, crotchety old shipbuilders, I guess, in Liverpool who wanted to work with the best wood in the world but didn't want to come here. Um, so the, the demand, the, the market for this is so strong and I just don't know if that can be overridden without changing a lot of the rules uh, of our economy. Um, market campaigns are a, p are, are a piece and, and those are active. Um, so, you know, working, working in corporate boardrooms to try and change some minds uh, and then if that doesn't work to shame, um, you know, uh, shame the companies and say, look, you know, this is, this is, uh, this is the kind of uh, impact that your products have you cut down these forests and 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 this is what that logging looks like this is what what is threatened um, and I might shift into uh, the, the next question um, which is around labor uh, and and uh, for foresters and what about uh, managing timber made from wood waste or manufactured timber sorry um, where we are seeing leadership within the industry is from some of the unions, uh, specifically the uh, public and private workers of Canada or the PPWC um, have, have for a couple years had a pretty progressive stance around old growth. And it's because, um, you know, at the end of the day, this isn't sustainable for workers either. You can only cut down old growth once and uh, we only have another decade or at most two uh, depending how fast it's cut, maybe not even that long in some of the province. And if too much of the industry is built on that, uh, we won't have we won't have sustainable uh, we won't have a sustainable industry. We won't have mills. We won't have uh, people working in forests. Um, so 
timber made from wood waste, uh, it could be exciting. Uh, the government has, the NDP government, one thing that they have done, they have, they've talked a lot about reducing waste, um, which was a, which would reduce that slash burning, which would be positive, um, and getting more uh, from it. Um, they've talked about value over volume. So instead of trying to cut as much as we can, why can't we get as much value from the logs we are cutting? Um, currently, we only have, one, we, we can only go up from there. Um, um, BC has one of the worst rates of jobs per tree cut in the world. Uh, every province in Canada does better because they're turning the wood into more things. And the rate, I think the highest rate in the world is Switzerland. Uh, they create the most jobs per tree cut and, and Switzerland is smaller than Vancouver Island. Um, but it's because they're not sending their logs away in raw form. They're not sending away two by fours. They're turning the wood into I don't know, cuckoo clocks or whatever they make in Switzerland. Um, so, so, so increasing that efficiency and getting more out of the trees we are cutting, that's, that's the future. That has to be the future. Um, okay, I'm behind on questions. So I'm there's a lot. I'm going to, I'm going to help you a bit. Okay. There's a, there's a few around the government, uh, government response. So um, questions, so I'll couple two. One is, um, other than talking to the MLA, uh, what what actions can everyone do to help all growth and and uh, really wake up the government? Because the, the second part of the question is, why are they just dancing around and, and not taking action? Yeah. Um... I mean, we've we've asked we've asked the forest minister that to 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 her face. Uh, you know, we've we've talked to people in government. Essentially, essentially, they see it as as too big a risk. Um, they they worry that. Uh, I mean, the, when a resource industry gets into trouble and is and is as late in the game as as forestry and logging in BC is. No one wants to deal with it, right? Um, you know, the, the East Coast cod or, or fossil fuels in some parts of Alberta, when these resources decline, um, it's not a good, it's, it's not good for the communities and, uh, and, and no government kind of wants to wear that. So I think, I think the last couple governments in BC have kind of just tried to drag this out and they see this big uh, overhaul, this complete uh, shift that needs to happen in the forests as, as too uncomfortable and too difficult. Um, and, and we've tried to say, look, this can be positive, but essentially, you know, movements like Fairy Creek are essentially trying to, to, to be more uncomfortable. Um, at my most cynical, I think that I think that the report, the government released that report, and 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 it says the status quo is unsustainable. It says we need a paradigm shift, and I think that maybe they don't know what they want to do. I think that they don't know what will hurt them more: logging mm -hmm. the last of the old growth and and leaving that legacy that will of course hurt us more in the long term, or. Will they make some changes? A couple big companies will walk away, lay off, lay off uh, workers, and and then they might lose the le next election. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think they're kind of weighing that. I think they they released the report last fall, and and I think they'd like to kind of wait, let the logging industry and the environmental movement beat each other up Figure for as out. long as they can. Okay. Um, so, so in terms of what we can do, uh, it's 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 let them know that they have to change. Um, you know, this can be discouraging to hear, um, but call them, email them, then call them again and ask for a meeting. Say, you're my MLA, I need to meet with you. Um, there's some different options for, for folks whose MLA is in opposition, um, but essentially politicians only act on the issues that they can't ignore. And, and, and we need to make this one that they can't ignore. Thank you. I'll, um, I'll go on to the, I, the, the continuation here goes to um, job loss. You mentioned that a little bit and that's a very high risk and do they really want to take that risk? So um, it's a simple question. What are the options? If we're looking at people losing their job and they're in the forestry right now, um, are we offering potential solutions? Is that a transition where we ask the government to have some funds available while we transition? Um, what are the recommendations in that front? 
Um, there's a there's a lot of pieces. Um, uh, those things that you mentioned are are, are all strong. Um, we talked a little bit about the value and the volume, um, and and a really important thing to to mention is you know if you if you for a second just kind of close your eyes and picture a forest industry worker, most people picture a logger. Most pe pe people people picture someone in the woods with a chainsaw cutting a tree down maybe someone driving those trees out of the out of the forest on the back of a truck that's actually the minority of the forest industry three quarters of all forest industry jobs aren't in the forest they're in mills and that's exciting because if we can keep those mills uh, productive and and create the same amount of jobs with fewer trees coming into them, um, turn them into more efficient uh, factories, essentially making more advanced things out of wood, we could keep the same amount of jobs while, while logging less. Um, a huge obvious problem is raw log exports, which is yet another thing that government was extremely uh, vocal on in opposition and, and have gone mysteriously quiet uh, in now that they're now that they form um, government. Uh, they, uh, they, uh, we currently export uh, five or six or seven million cubic meters of timber every single year. Um, and that's hard to picture. A cubic meter is roughly a city telephone pole. So six million city telephone poles. Um, we calculated how many uh, how many cubic meters would fit on a logging truck, and then we and then I just did the math. And if we took all the logs that we exported raw every year and put them onto logging trucks, and then lined those logging trucks up. Uh, nose to tail, so they were touching. They would start on Granville Street in downtown Vancouver, and they would end in Montreal. Wow. That's how much wood we're sending uh, overseas, completely unprocessed. We cut the trees down, we cut the branches off, we put them on ships and send them away. So diverting those forests or some of those forests to local mills, we could keep people working uh, in the mills. And then that piece that I spoke to on my second or third to last slide, um, the, the part about uh, forest re rehabilitation and silviculture, um, you know, going through a, a 50 year old forest where the trees are all packed together and cutting some of them off at 40 feet and cutting some of them right down and, and leaving them in the forest to, to give those nutrients back. This is all, uh, all these methods to uh, increase, make, make a tree plantation more like a forest, make, make it better at fighting climate change. Uh, this is not only has that obvious benefit it, but it's incredibly labor intensive. Um, so I think it's a combination of, of getting more efficient, doing what other places do. Uh, Quebec and Ontario both get far more jobs per tree cut down. Washington and Oregon uh, get way more jobs per tree cut down. Learning from these okay. places uh, and making more uh, from, from less uh, and then putting people to work, uh, healing the forest as opposed to just uh, extracting them. Obviously, this is going to take massive uh, government investment, um, but I think the pandemic is showing us that when we want to do something, we can, we can fund it, uh, and, and that has to be where our head's at. There's just so much at stake. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you. You just mentioned uh, Oregon briefly, so I'm going to jump to a question on that with the uh, carbon offset programs apparently uh, in place, um, such as Oregon. What are your thoughts on using offset markets for protection in BC? Um, I mean, as tempted as I am to, to, to do anything that will protect old growth forests, um, I, I'm, I'm leery of carbon offsets um, as, a, as a scheme or as a, as a structure. Uh, essentially, you know, they have their, the, the value uh, in terms of, of providing a jurisdiction uh, with, with uh, funding in, term, in exchange for keeping the forest standing. Um, that's positive, but they're often used, those credits go onto a market usually. Um, and, you know, if, if uh, we're setting aside a forest in BC uh, in exchange for, for, for funding uh, to support communities and then that funding's coming from Shell 
who bought uh, those mm. carbon credits in order to build the dirtiest oil refinery in the world on the Niger Delta in Africa and call it carbon neutral. Um, that's not that's not progress. Um, so to me, the, the, the problem that we're in is because of the monetization of, of these forests, of these ecosystems. And to me, uh, that's not going to be what's, what gets it out of um, gets us out of it. Um, the one exception being, you know, if a, if a First Nation gets uh, control of their forest back and, and chooses to uh, go that route, I think that should be up to them. Um, so yeah, I, uh, I, I, I'm generally leery of, of carbon offsets and, and think mm -hmm. that uh, more thoughtful and uh, intentional legislation is a, is a better route. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, so around uh, a route to resolution, there's a, a good, question, good question here around um, what we can ask our MLAs and municipal governments to do. Um, the, I'm going to share very quickly my interesting observation. I actually met with the MLA uh, in the district of uh, North Vancouver um, here and um, very, very eager to take action and wanting to be educated some more, but it starts with that education. I knew more than she does on the old growth and what the NDP's plan was, so that's a bit scary. <laughs> um, but um, there's a good question around, should, should we pressure those municipal governments for resolutions um, to, on uh, finding alternatives to the old growth logging? Or should it be up to uh, the communities to um, share what some of those options would be just with, uh, with what you shared earlier about um, the indigenous uh, um, populations working in the forest to try and, and bring the ecosystem to back to what it was and, and creating jobs that way. So how do you see that circle around who should bring forward the resolution? Is it up to us just individuals to propose ideas or do we pressure with voicing that we just don't wanna see this logging happening anymore? Um, yeah, I think that it has to be, it has to be twofold. Um, we need to be talking about solutions and talking about alternatives, but there are there are a lot of good ideas uh, out there existing. Um, it's just it's missing uh, it's missing a the access. So the vast majority of, of forests in in BC are controlled on big corporate tenures. And, uh, you know, so, so shifting that a little bit, uh, a, a, a First Nation or a municipality is inherently going to manage uh, a forest better uh, because they live right there, you know, versus, versus a company uh, headquartered at best in downtown Vancouver, if not much further abroad. Um, that's a huge piece. Um, but the other, the other piece is, is just pumping, pu we have to pump the brakes on the problem, right? Um, because not only are we losing, we're, we're not just losing the ability to conserve the last old growth forest, we're, we're um, losing the ability to, to do the kind of forestry that, that we want 20 or 30 years from now, um, because too many old growth forests and too many second growth forests will be gone. Um, so I guess uh, in terms of, of an ask, what we should be telling MLAs, it's, you know, we, we need to create space for those uh, for those alternatives, but what's in the way of that is is the juggernaut of the status quo and, and the momentum that status quo logging has. Uh, so so the, the answer is 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 right in front of them. Uh, it's in the report uh, mm -hmm. that uh, that they got um, on page sixty seven. I'll share the report in the chat again right there. Uh, on page sixty seven uh, of the report is is a timeline, and the panel said in the first six months we need to uh we need to um we need to uh protect the most at risk um mm -hmm. old growth uh forest uh in it so that they're not lost while we talk about it the classic mm -hmm. uh, kind of slogan in bc is talk and log governments talk about it meanwhile the logging companies keep going um so yeah you know they, they need to implement the the panel's uh reports the recommendations um pardon me uh and and a key one is around funding they need to they need if 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 
the government's going to a First Nation or to a local community and saying, hey, look, you know, do you, should we protect old growth or should we keep going? That with any money on the table that they're not really asking, right? Because the choice is, mm-hmm. is log or poverty. Um, government has to be developing solutions and say, look, we have this package of funding available. We're going to take a year. We're going to protect the old growth. And then we're going to invest in engagement and discussions with the community, see if we can't get some alternatives off the ground, uh, and then hopefully keep that forest moving forward. Um, mm-hmm. In the interim, uh, again, I'm seeing in the, in the comments uh, around the blockade, and, and that's what they're about, right? They're, they're to keep these the last few places standing. So um, if people have, you know, financial or, or, or can get out there um, or know people that can get out there, these are, these are, you know, this is a long standing, it's as old as the environmental movement um, and it has been necessary. It's kept a lot of forests that are still here standing um, because <laughs> if the government won't uh, create the time and the space to develop these solutions and to figure out which alternatives we're gonna use moving forward, then, then people are going to step in and do that. So mm-hmm. um, again, the Ferry Creek uh, blockade is is that front line right now, uh, mm-hmm. and and you know that uh, that's that's a pressure point on government uh, to to wake up and okay. uh, and and to and to move faster because we just we don't have time to take another five or ten years to talk yeah. about this. Thank you so much. I'm going to add one comment because I think the the group would uh, would find that pretty fascinating too. And then I'll I'll bring one more question. And I'm sorry we won't be able to get to all the questions. Um, uh, and Torrance, you shared with me the um, not to get too political again, but the NDP had mentioned wanting to protect 353,000 hectares of old growth. Actually, this is incorrect. Out of that, a lot of it is protected. Between 100 and 150,000 hectares of that is second growth. And some of the terrain is not um, uh, reachable by the companies because it might be on steep place or swamp. So the actual uh, really at risk old growth areas is 3,800 versus 353,000. So it, it talks to the, a little bit about the, the green marketing, greenwashing uh, also that we're hearing. So that was an interesting uh, piece of stat. And uh, I know you have more about that on your website. One last comment I wanna ask because we're here about our kids. What's happening in the curriculums at school? Old growth, are you aware of anything around that? Or do you have any recommendations on how to make our children also more aware of uh, mm-hmm. these precious ecosystems? Um, I don't know uh, exactly what, what's required. Um, my, uh, my wife is actually a, a grade two teacher. Uh, and so I can speak a little bit to the, uh, the freedom that teachers have in terms of, of what they teach. You know, a lot of the curriculum uh, in terms of the things that are used to deliver it, uh, it's up to the individual teachers. Um, and so, you know, I would assume it would vary by, by teacher. Um, I know that there are some external programs. Um, I've talked a little bit about another organization Sierra Club BC. Uh, they have an education program in schools across the province. Um, but in terms of what the actual curriculum says on it, I, I don't actually know. That's a really good question and something I could live in. I, I should look into. Okay, and maybe something some of us with the children can uh, go talk to their teachers about. Yeah, yeah, that good. Would be great. Thank you so much. We have one minute for a very quick wrap up. This was fascinating. Thank you, Terence. I'll pass it over to Lorna. Okay, so thank you. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much, Torrance. Like, thank you, thank you for your time this evening. Thank you for sharing everything you know about old growth, and thank you for all the work you're doing. It's really, we're really grateful, and hopefully, we can support you. Um, so, just to wrap up, um, thanks everyone for joining. If you go to the North Shore for our kids website, if you want to stay in touch with us, just click on the "I'm in" button, and then you'll get all our emails and newsletters about the rest of our work. Um, and if you go there, you'll see that we've got quite a few other campaigns on the go at the moment. We've got a petition about Bill C-12 that we're working with some other local North Vancouver groups on. Um, We've been doing a divestment campaign since January, um, talking to our banks about divesting their investments. And if you want to learn more about that, we're doing an event on April the 7th, um, just to give you some tips about how to talk to your bank. Um, And then our next weekly uh, speaker series is on April the 22nd on Earth Day. 
and we've got Phil Gregory and Jackie Bradley talking to us about regenerative agriculture. So please do join us for that. Um, so yeah, lastly, thank you everyone for coming. Thank you so much, Torrance. And if anybody from For Our Kids wants to stay on the line and talk about how we can work together on old growth, um, please do, and we'll keep the keep the Zoom open.